Sigmund Freud has been hovering over this entire unit. His path-breaking work ignited artists' determination to explore the inner world of the psyche, and it gave them the freedom to portray sexual themes much more openly. Giorgio de Chirico was really a precursor of surrealism. The first surrealist manifesto wouldn't appear until 1924. So his style is referred to as metaphysical painting, a search for hidden realities, usually in his hometown of Ferrara, Italy. The three muses in the foreground of the painting on the left are disquieting, according to the artist, because they were the pathway to overcome appearances and allowed the viewer to engage in a discourse with the unknown. As for the unknown, what's going to happen to the girl with the hoop? If this were a movie, I would guess something bad. Another painter of dreamscapes who does not appear in your textbook, but whom I happen to love, so you're going to encounter him anyway, is Marc Chagall. Chagall was a Russian Jew who emigrated to Paris, but continued to paint visions of his Jewish childhood and of his life in Paris. You recognize the fiddler on the roof, right? This painting inspired the play and the musical. Chagall worked through most of the 20th century, and many of his most famous works were inspired by the Bible. In addition to paintings, he worked in stained glass, and here are a couple of examples. This is the design for one of his stained glass windows uh, for a hospital in Jerusalem. The theme was the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm including this work because Pope Francis caused something of an uproar when he stated that this was his favorite painting. Didn't the Pope know the painter was Jewish? Well, of course he knew. And he found it entirely appropriate that Chagall had portrayed Christ as a Jew being persecuted by communists and Nazis. I think this is a wonderful painting and further evidence that the Catholic Church now has a very interesting Pope. But enough self-indulgence. Back to works that your textbook and probably the College Board as well think you should know. Max Ernst was one of the artists who moved from Dada to Surrealism. And the painting in this slide has elements of both. A nightingale threatening? Why is a gate moving out from the picture? Does that sound maybe a little Dada? But it could also be a dreamscape. So let's return to the Art of the Western World video at this point for an introduction to surrealism. The video talked about two roots to surrealism. Here is a work by Miro that employed automatism as well as more traditional painting. Miro began this painting by making a collage with assembled fragments cut from a catalog, and then he added dramatic accents. And here's an earlier Miro painting, which is an abstract depiction of the landscape of Miro's Catalan homeland. Don't be misled by the name, by the way. Miro was a male painter. This is probably the most famous surrealist painting by the most famous surreal painter, and I'm trusting that you listen to a podcast about it. Again, note the extreme precision of the painting, combined with that dreamlike unreality of the subject. What could this be about? The caption of this painting, translated from the French, is, This is not a pipe. A commentary, perhaps, on efforts to read or misread abstract art. And again, it has some Dada elements. Those boundaries are not always clear. Uh, this is a work the College Board loves, be warned. Uh, it's a surrealist object inspired by a conversation between the artist, a woman artist, Merritt Oppenheim, and artist Pablo Picasso and Dora Maar at a Paris cafe. Admiring Oppenheim's fur-covered bracelet, Picasso remarked that one could cover anything with fur, to which she replied, that is the artist, even this cup and saucer. Soon after, when asked by André Breton, remember, Surrealism's leader, to participate in the first surrealistic exhibition dedicated to objects, Oppenheim bought a teacup, saucer, and spoon at a department store and covered them with the fur of a Chinese gazelle. In so doing, she transformed genteel items traditionally associated with feminine decorum into a sensuous piece of tableware. Like so much of the art in this unit, this one seems to be all about sex. If you do have a chance to listen to Sister Wendy's take on this period, you'll learn that she thinks that Salvador Dali produced a horrible painting, but that she really likes Swiss painter Paul Clay, who also employs surrealistic images. And here's another painting that Sister Wendy loves. I'm trying to give you an incentive to watch the video. Before we move into the rise of Nazism and the approach of World War II, let's just take a quick detour back to America. We'll spend more time there in our last two lectures. 
During the Depression, the government sponsored art as part of its relief program. One of the artists was photographer Dorothea Lang, whose photographs of rural depression really transfixed Americans and helped create new support for government welfare programs. Here's another photograph. I just think this has a wonderful evocation of place. Now, this painting is actually post-depression, but it still captures the bleak mood of an era wracked first by economic and then by global catastrophe. A good example, by the way, of a dramatic use of lighting. You've all seen this painting, right? Another major American artistic movement between the wars was called regionalism. And just as it sounds, it focused on rural life, on the specific culture of different reason, uh, regions, and it returned to a more realistic style. Uh, Thomas Hart Benton is another important artist from this school, and here's another example. Note that both of these regionalist paintings show the strength of these rural people and the difficulty of their lives. These paintings are not merely sentimental. Oh, I'm moving too quickly over important art. The 1930s also saw the rise of Mexican mural paintings, many of which had a strong political content motivated by the Mexican Revolution that overthrew military rule early in the 20th century. Most of these Mexican muralists were men of the left, men and women of the left, often communists. Uh, they hearkened back to the ancient traditions of Latin America, including the Native American traditions, uh, and had a constant theme about the oppression of not only colonialism, but also economic imperialism. I'm going to let Ms. Jacobs fill this out more because this is one of her very favorite artists and she knows a lot about her. Mexican painter Frida Kahlo is usually classed as a surrealist, but her work also includes political commentary. And in this painting, we see the artist torn between her two heritages her Mexican mother, and her German father. And the way the heart is connected with tubes, obviously this is a kind of surrealistic dreamscape, and yet it's also making a political statement. Uh, similarly, you see the painting uh, where she's surrounded by thorns and a hummingbird, which is a symbol of death. Uh, she was a person who had a personally very troubled life, and again, I'm going to let Ms. Jacobs tell you more about that. Uh, Frida Kahlo was married then divorced from and married again to Diego Rivera, who's the most famous of the Mexican mural painters. Here you see his depiction of, of ancient Mexico. Uh, Rivera sparked a huge controversy uh, when the Rockefellers initially hired him to decorate the interior of their Art Deco building, the Rockefeller Center. We just saw that. When Rivera included, among others, Lenin in his mural about progress, the Rockefellers fired him and his paintings were destroyed. Okay, I'm going to close with this chapter from Picasso's, uh, this chapter with Picasso's famous depiction of the horrors of war and our last video clip. In my final lectures, I will look at the world and the art that emerged after World War II. These lectures will take us to the present and to the May AP Art History exam.